morning, good morning, good morning. How are you? How are you this lovely morning? We're in October, it's October the 2nd. Remember October the 1st? Remember April the 1st and October the 1st? I'll give credit to anyone who can tell me what the significance of April the 1st and October the 1st were in the dental calendar. If you can, that will date you somewhat. But uh, yeah, it's uh, had a bit of rain overnight, the roads are wet, the sky is uh, very uniform grey, great for photography. And uh, I'm on my way to work. Ha ha ha! Yes! Angry still in a job. So I hadn't made a video for a while. I don't know why I'm making them, to be honest. I mean, you have to do something because you want to, don't you? You have to do, you mustn't just do something because somebody else wants you to. I mean, you know, unless it's, uh, unless you want to do it. If you want to do it because they want you to do it, then do it. But anyway, it's getting too complicated too early. What I'm saying is basically, I believe in volunteerism. So, you know, you should do things because you want to volunteer to do them. And I think that was the same with dental politics with me. It was always voluntary, you know. I always did it because I wanted to. I didn't do it because I thought other people needed me to or I thought other people wanted me to. <laughs> I didn't care whether other people wanted me to. I did it anyway. <laughs> In fact, a lot of people didn't want me to. But uh, I still did it because I wanted to. And uh, I've probably mentioned this before, but uh, round about the 1990-1992, uh, the first uh, NHS contract uh, negotiations, I was on a British Dental Association subcommittee called the General Dental Services Subcommittee, which is the one that dealt mainly with uh, high street dentists. And the chairman was a guy called Keith Osterlow. And the uh, chairman of the General Dental Services Committees have always, uh, always had OBEs and MBEs but mainly OBEs and um, uh, despite the fact that they voted, uh, the GDC voted in favour of the new NHS contract, Osterloh never got an MBE or an OBE because he was like, there was some genuine debate, you know, there was some actual, uh, you know, it was in doubt about whether or not the vote was going to go the way the government wanted or not and they expressed their displeasure by it leaving him off the honours list and uh, at the time a lot of the guys on the committee said you know you know what a shame he put all that work in and he didn't get he didn't get the M what they they call it didn't get an O and um, and I thought that it's, if you're working under that sort of system you're working for the wrong reasons aren't you if you're doing something at the behest of someone else in the expectation of reward then you're not really, uh, you're not working for yourself, are you? You're not working for your own ideas and beliefs. So, uh, that's, I always remember that because I thought, well, if that was why he was doing it, then I feel sorry for him. I feel sorry that he didn't get what he wanted. But I don't know whether he felt sorry for himself. I mean, perhaps he, perhaps he didn't care. Perhaps he just did it. He did it because he wanted to. But then that's not the way it used to work in the BDA. You and you didn't rise to the top to do what you wanted, what you wanted. You rose to the top to do what somebody else wanted. <laughs> and I'm sure they were royally pissed off that they they sort of not manoeuvred him into that position, but allowed him to allowed him into that position, and then found that uh, he wasn't the sort of the stooge that uh, they uh, they expected. You know. Um, and they had a long line of stooges before and after Keith Osterloh, but he sort of stood out. Uh, a nice enough guy, I flew to New York. We went to, uh, on a BDA thing to New York with him six months after 9-11. But uh, it, was a, it was a very depressed New York we found, you know, still in shock. Still all filing past the wreck of the Twin Towers and everything. And uh, uh, Statue of Liberty was still shut. And uh, basically, they were just a, you know, really sort of. Um, they weren't miserable people, but they, you know, they, 
this American exceptionalism, this this uh, idea that they could, that we were untouchable, had been burst. Had been had bu the, their bubble had been burst, and uh, they were still coming to terms with that. So it was a difficult, and of course the security at the airports was just insane. You know, which wasn't helped on the return journey when our flight was in the evening and the tour company dropped us off at the airport about nine o'clock in the morning. So we had to spend the whole day in the bloody airport. Anyway, so um, yeah, so you know, the way these videos were distributed, I used to, through the membership of the DPA DFO, used to send out a link to members and say, look, there's a new video and used to get a few people used to watch them and one or two used to watch every single one of them and uh, and hopefully you know it was a bit it's a bit of fun isn't it it's a bit of fun 20 minutes not overly not overly onerous if you wash it on 1.4 times you can get through it pretty quickly uh, but um, since the uh, DFO sort of uh, folded up well it wasn't folded up I mean basically it just petered out in uh, in June, um, uh, obviously I've not been sending out links to members, but I did send out a link to members saying that if you want to receive these videos, then all you have to do is subscribe on YouTube. So, um, but uh, you know, it's not. Uh, you know, I'm never going to. I'm not, I'm not going to challenge ITN in terms of viewership. So they, they don't need to worry if you're watching from ITN, which you won't be. Uh, don't worry, which you're not. So, what's going on? What's up? What's up? I uh, I found uh, you know having having been in the business sort of 35 years, and then and also with a 10-year break in the middle, and coming back into it, I found that the um, obviously the inspection and testing and compliance requirements are, are, are insane. I mean, literally insane. So, um, and one of the, my biggest bugbears is the PAYE. And uh, so they brought in the risk requirement to contribute to the staff pensions. And uh, they couldn't use the same system, could they? They couldn't just do it on PAYE, no, could they? No. They have to bring in this pension, separate pensions body. We have to register with and then calculate how much and then, then make a separate payment, etc., etc. So, um, so uh, one of the first things I did was uh, have a look at my wages and decide that. Uh, I uh, was going to make one member of staff redundant because uh, we were we were top heavy in terms of employment and uh, could um, you know could do with one member staff less and the pensions thing played a big part in that I know it probably didn't when I was doing it at the time I didn't mention the pensions thing but basically getting the wage bill down in terms of the, um, the the overall amount and the employers and the national insurance and PAY contribution etc but then the pension was like almost like the straw that broke the camel's back I'm just like I don't really want to employ people anymore you know I'm just not I'm not as a single-handed practitioner I'm just not up to the task and yet I don't want to uh, subcontract the job and the reason why I don't want to subcontract the job despite the fact that you know you could put you could probably find some payroll firm that would would handle your payroll calculations for one pound per employee so it's, you know you certainly can if you use QuickBooks online so I think it's one pound per employee but um, what that means is that um, there are two problems with subcontracting your payroll one is that you have to tell them in advance what you're going to pay and we pay hourly and we pay on a timesheet so you'd have to um, sort of guess what the staff are going to work and then you know and they'll want to know like 10 days in advance probably about by about the middle of the month they're going to want to know what you're paying your employees at the end of the month and then that that just annoys me and then um, the second thing is that um, if you're going to uh, in the past when I've looked into it they basically they tell you exactly uh, well ha ha actually no it's just this second one doesn't apply so much nowadays because nowadays they have to do real-time you you have to do real-time reporting and so you have to tell the tax people at the end of the month how much money you owe them and they will then you know from that second onwards start start moaning and groaning about the fact that you haven't paid it 
were and that didn't used to be like that you know that sort of little bit of flexibility that you've got in terms of paying a week or two late which is so important for self-employed businesses you know that just that little bit of wiggle room that uh, you, you sometimes that you need uh, and you don't get it so much with a payroll company they're, they're pretty much well you know we've worked out your payroll and in two weeks time you've got to pay three thousand pounds in the new whether you've got it or not so um and uh, and also you know if they um if if you can't reconcile your figures with their figures and this is this is all the time now i mean i'm not kidding i've been running a business for three years now and the figures on my computer have never matched the figures on their computer whatever my computer tells me i need to pay never ever matches when i go on their website what they say i need to pay and i had a visit from somebody from the pay people and, and she said and i said to her a lot because they come round and they say you know uh, we're going to come round and uh, have a chat you know so i'm like well okay so how can you help me oh we can't help you we're just here to check that you know that you have to pay x pound of pounds on time and and just to make sure that you know that and that and ask you whether you have got the money or whether you've gone bankrupt so no help as such and no no ability to help you know i mean literally just some random housewife who's like like all the middle middle tier bureaucracies just uh, employ second wage earners you know to go around and and do this sort of stupid bureaucratic uh, make work and um, in the old days you know when your figures didn't agree with the inland revenues figures you used to be able to put all the sheets of paper on the floor and kneel down and just have a look at everything and, and try and work out where the discrepancy was but now you can't now you've got if your figures don't agree with theirs then you've got um, one black box which is your computer system telling you one thing and another black box which is the inland revenues computer system telling you a different figure and of course you don't know what you're doing you know you don't know what altitude you're flying at it's like a uh, it's like a plane with two altimeters one that says 3,000 and the other one says 5,000 feet and and you don't know you don't know whether it's three five or or the average four so uh, but she said oh well the figures are that we only use the figures you give us you know you pay the staff you press the button the whole thing is sent off uh, electronically and then that's that's the only way we know is by uh, work you know taking the steer off of what you told us so I'm like yeah I do understand that you know I report the figures but then when you don't get the same number as my computer program I don't know why and I can't work out why either so for three years we've had a completely different um, set of figures to the inland revenue and I just dial into their website and, and bung them a bit of money once in a while and it's not helped by the fact that you know if you pay like suppose you pay a week late you might have to pay like £2.50 interest which I don't mind to be honest with you I do not mind paying a week late and paying £2.50 I do not care okay but what happens is that you then you then pay that two pound fifty, and then there's perhaps another one pound ninety from another month, and then a three pound ten from the month before, and then uh, and you can't clear all of these with one payment. Every one of them has to be a separate payment, a separate card payment, a separate reference number. Go back to the beginning, start again, pay that two pounds with a separate reference number. Go back to the beginning, start again, and then um, then when you dial in, you find that. Um, due to the delay between you paying off your £3.10 and uh, them, them clearing the thing off that you've now got like a 21 pence that now, now needs to be cleared off of that off of that payment so they really honestly you know the whole thing is is just insufferable intolerable inoperable it's just it cannot be it, it, it's just out of control you know it's just not fit for purpose so so now, you know, by, by taking up so much of my time that I can't generate enough profit to pay for a third member of staff, uh, and, and as a result, bumping the unemployment figures and, you know, and having to pay out benefits and uh, have someone else on uh, welfareism, um, you know, for the, for the want of just making a sensible scheme. 
I've now got two members of staff, and I'm not kidding, they earn about £1,100 a month each, because they're both part-time, right? So about £1,100 a month each. And then I have to make a pension contribution towards them. And that pension contribution, it's about £8 a month, £10 a month, something like that. But of course, it's a whole new system, it's a whole new, you have to register, there's a whole new load of rules that they expect you to have read and memorised, like they have to. Um, and, um, you know, and I just can't be asked. I can't be asked, to be honest. Basically, what I do is I wait until I am about 50 quid, and then I bung them 50 quid. And then we wait a few more months, and then I bung them another 50 quid. And that's about the limit of my involvement with this thing. I, I am not going to keep logging into these bloody systems every day just to bung them a few quid. So, anyway, so I keep getting these emails from Nest. The nest, right? They're the, the cuckoo in the nest is the government, but the, fun, the thing is called Nest. And if anybody thinks, if anybody thinks who's getting a Nest pension, that there's going to be enough in it for them to do anything when they retire, other than have a, one last decent meal before they jump in front of a train at a level crossing, then they are sadly deluded. And any money that's in a Nest pension, by the time anyone gets any money out of a Nest pension, you won't you'll need two thousand pound to buy a ham sandwich because the money's going to be so devalued by inflation tax that uh, it, it won't uh, the whole thing is a pointless exercise in trying to cover up the fact that the um, the government has doesn't have a pension scheme as they've spent the money they've literally they've, they've not saved anything for our pensions we've given them all this money for our pensions and they've just basically debased the currency and spent and spent everything so uh, so I keep getting these emails saying they're going to report me to the pensions regulator they're going to report me to the pensions regulator so yesterday 1st of October I've done the wages and I thought right I'm finally going to sit down bung them 50 quid shut them up and I open up my inbox what have I got they've reported me to the pensions regulator <laughs> oh fuck <laughs> Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. <laughs> One day earlier and I would have got away with it, but now, now I've been reported to the pensions regulator. Now, now I'm in trouble, now I tell you. Wait until that old pensions, wait, never mind about him dealing with the CNA pensions or the Mark Suspensions pensions. Never mind him dealing about the Sports Direct pensions and all the other big schemes that have gone bust. Wait until he finds out that I'm 50 pounds in arrears on my pensions, oh my God. He's gonna to write to my staff and tell them that that their pensions are in arrears so I don't know what he's gonna to do to be honest I think I'll probably get a letter from the pensions regulator stating that I've been reported so and that, of course I haven't been reported it's a fucking algorithm it's a computer's reporting me they have <coughs> <coughs> if I have an, an aneurysm then or what is it Del Boy says I'm gonna have a connery I'm gonna have a connery at this right <laughs> <laughs> this computer basically they've said to it send out six warnings and then and then uh, put in an automatic dial into the pensions regulator API application program interface and give them the this uh, reference number and tell them that we're do doing a technical report so fine so now I'll let you know if anything happens with that well, I'll bung them a bit of money and then you know I'll bung them a bit more money and then see what happens with the report I mean shut up in an ideal world they'll ban me from being an employer I'd like them to ban me from being an employer I would like that I'd like to I would like to not be able to employ anybody uh, then we'll see well, we'll have to see won't we I'll have to get someone else to employ my staff or I'll have to subcontract it or I'll have to uh, make them self-employed or something I don't know what the hell I'm gonna do I should make them self-employed to be honest I should uh, tell them to get a little part-time job somewhere else and and go self-employed but what a joke I mean li really what a joke and they don't email you either these people they just don't they say uh, you know um, they like send you an email saying that you've got a new message you've got a new message you've got a new message so 
and everyone says we're we're thinking about reporting you to the pensions beggar. Every single message I got from them says we're thinking of reporting you to the pensions regulator. So in the end, I've just gave up. I just because not that because I didn't think that they were going to report me, but because the urgency of the content was not unrelated to the urgency of the title. You know, the title, if it had said we're going to report you to the pensions regulator tomorrow, I might have dialed in. But basically, every time you go there, it's just some incomprehensible email saying you've got, uh, the last one says you're, you've got 12 staff. And I'm like, I haven't got 12 staff, I've got two staff. And then, and then we went online, didn't we? Did QuickBooks Online, uh, the suggestion of our accountant. And he, um, he said, oh no, you've got to try QuickBooks Online. So we went and we did from QuickBooks Desktop to QuickBooks Online, and that handles the payroll. And then because uh, we, were then, we were then treated as a new startup, they literally gave us a different employer's reference and everything, different gateway ID and everything. <clears throat> and, uh, and so, so I'm getting, you know, I've, so then I'm, and then we had, then it was a disaster. So we then went back to QuickBooks desktop. So I then had to type in everything, backdate everything so that it was continuous and ignore the online data. But then of course I, but then I had an online payroll data account, didn't I? And so, so now I'm, now I'm hopelessly confused because it thinks, now it thinks I'm running two businesses with twice the number of staff. And every time that you uh, pay late, one day late, it says, oh, you, you've got another employee who's late. It doesn't say you've got the same two employees that are three months late. It says you've got six employees who are late. So anyway, I'll, when I've got time, I shall dial in and try and sort the state out. Because the state can't sort itself out, and the state doesn't can't sort me out, so it's up to me to sort the state out, isn't it? I'm going to have to try and make some sense out of what they're doing. But it shouldn't be like that. I don't even think we should pay if in tax. I don't think like a business with two two employees and a turnover of less than two hundred thousand pound a year should even pay uh, income tax on its employees. It's just ridiculous state is now thinking of more more blooming taxes forget what it was they're gonna put they've been they've uh, imposed a tax on sugar I mean where on earth is that what's <laughs> what's the idea behind that where's that money gonna go that's just gonna go into some general coffer oh what was it they produced they're proposing another tax on something else I can't remember what it is everything's gonna be taxed oxygen will be taxed eventually You'll be taxed on the amount of oxygen that you breathe. You're taxed on the amount of water that you consume. Oh, so that's what that is what is on my mind as I drive to work this grey Tuesday. Not the patients. Actually, well, I was going to talk a bit about the DFO, and I was going to talk a bit about ethical selling as well because. Uh, I had a rather good experience with my Peugeot garage yesterday. Very pleased with them. But uh, I've ended up just having a massive rant about the PAYE and pensions. But which I apologise about that. But if you can learn anything from my experience, including uh, how long it takes the pensions regulator to get so pissed off that they lock you up, uh, then uh, it's useful for you, isn't it? Because if you're a self-employed dentist, you're employing people, I presume. You know, I mean, I know a lot of you out there work for corporates now, uh, but I also know that nobody watches this video, so so you're not affected. When you're making content that nobody watches, it doesn't really matter, does it? Because it's not irrelevant to nobody. Right, here we are. So, nice busy day today, hygienist day today. I'll, uh, I'll talk to you soon. Bye.